Father, we want to come before you this evening and just ask that you would bless our time together. Um, as we look into your word, I pray you just open our hearts, open our eyes, Lord, to see you clearer, and just open our ears, Lord, to hear. And I pray for anyone that tunes in, you would just use, uh, that your word would just go forth and do that work, Lord. Soften hearts and help us to be receptive, help us to be open, and just listening to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, here we go again. It is Thursday, it's about 6.50, 6.55, almost 7. If I keep kind of looking this way, I'm trying something a little different with two cameras tonight so that the YouTubers can get on later and catch this video. And if if this video ends up pausing or, you know, sometimes with Facebook Live there's disruption, um, disturbance, uh, so... If that happens, you can catch this afterwards. Um, I don't know how long after, but you can find it on YouTube if you just search uh, Calvary Chapel of Santa Rosa, and we have a channel on there. So I, I believe last week's uh, study is up already. <clears throat> so, John, the Gospel of John, chapter 6. And we're continuing... Through. So we left off at John 6, verse 14, and um, praise the Lord. Uh, we'll see how far we make it. I think I, I titled, on the title for this, I, I wrote John chapter 6, verse 15, with a dash, because there's a lot of verses, and there's no hurry, there's no rush. I'm just going to see where the Lord, how, how long we go. Um, it's always a mystery, and that's fine. So, um, this is very hard to get used to with two cameras, but I will do my best to pay attention to you as well as pay attention to you. Um, so, John chapter 6, we left off with him in the familiar story in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14 that we looked at last time we were together um, was the feeding of the 5,000. That Jesus feeds the multitudes and there was a lot that we looked at with, with that miracle and um, if you hadn't, haven't heard it or if you weren't uh, around you, you might go check out on YouTube again John chapter 6 and uh, and I'm trying to remember the title. I think it was uh, from so from so little uh, great things from such little thing. It, it, I, that's not the right title, but um, something great out of something so little, and uh, that's exactly what Jesus does uh, today in my life and in many people's lives. He makes something so great out of something or someone so little um, and so uh, weak. And it's, it's really encouraging. It's really uh, a great reminder of how our Lord and Savior uh, is so faithful in those things. So picking up in verse 15, John chapter 6, verse 15, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force, um, to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. And, e and when evening was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea, and they entered into a ship, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. So, um, Jesus did not go with them, but one thing I want to touch on that I thought was really interesting is in the verse before, in um, John 6, 14 there, we have that those men, when they had seen the miracles that Jesus did, uh, they said, this is of a true prophet. 
uh, or that prophet that would come. And I mentioned Deuteronomy 18.15, uh, the prophet that Moses had, had uh, talked about, written about long before this. Um, no doubt that's what they were referring to. Um, but it's interesting because Jesus would... Um, Jesus would become established as a prophet. And, um, and then they wa wanted to skip a thing because there's three things that just the gifts that were brought to Jesus speak of. When Jesus was a baby, we often think of Christmas time when Jesus was um, come into this world. Uh, the, the great incarnation um, when he, he was born in Bethlehem um, he, I should say came as a man he always existed but when he came onto the scene that's what the incarnation is all about uh, when he came uh, through the Virgin Mary they brought gifts and what they brought spoke of these three ministries um, prophet the uh, the myrrh, um, priest, the frankincense. Uh, so often the frankincense um, was cooked into much of the, the showbread and the different elements that the priesthood, they worked with frankincense quite a bit. And then the gold spoke of king. So you have the prophet, the priest, and the king. And, and what I mean by them in verse 15, wanting to take him by force, and to make him a king, they were skipping out on this uh, priestly ap, uh, aspect of Jesus and fulfillment of Jesus coming. That he was not only the prophet, uh, but he would be the high priest, the great high priest, and also the king. He's, he's going to be the king. And I always like to add to that... Um, before each one of those, more than. So he's more than just a prophet. He's more than just a priest. And he's more than just a king. He's, he's uh, the great high priest, the chief <laughs> priest. Um, he's, he's the greatest of all the prophets and not just one of the prophets. And he's also the king of kings. So um, let that be noted. I don't know... Uh, if you found that as interesting as I did, I thought it was worth noting um, that Jesus would be uh, the prophet and the perfect priest and also the king of kings. So he was um, all three of those. And one thing to make note of uh, in verse 15 is that he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Why is that important? Well, concerning his priesthood, concerning the role of the priest, the priest on one day a year, Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, would go into the Holy of Holies, and he would have to go in alone. And so this becomes, again, pointing us to his priestly ministry, his priesthood, um, the, the priesthood of Jesus. Um, and and he's a royal priesthood. He's he's a um, he's an incredibly uh, he's the fulfillment of of the priest of the job and duty of the priest, and uh, not to be made king yet. Uh, he's going to fulfill that his kingly entrance. He's going to fulfill Zechariah nine nine that he would come on a colt on a donkey and riding into Jerusalem. Um, on a very particular day spoken of by Daniel the prophet at a very spe uh, specific time and again fulfilling uh, Zach Zechariah 9.9. 9. Um, and so you have Jesus Christ more than a prophet, more than a priest, and we will see he's the king of kings. He's more than just a king. Uh, John chapter 6 continuing, uh, we see that the disciples went out into the sea on a boat, on a ship. And in verse uh, 19, or sorry, verse 18, 
Jesus was not with them at the end of verse 17. In verse 18, John chapter 6, verse 18, the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty uh, or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. You would have been too. I would have been too. Be afraid. Be very afraid. <laughs> Even though Jesus, uh, here he's, he's coming on the water, walking on the water unto them. They didn't recognize that it was Jesus. They didn't know at this point that it was Jesus. So I like to put myself in their shoes, in the shoes of the disciples there in the boat. One thing that, that we're not told of uh, in verse 17, that Jesus was not come unto them, and that he, uh, back in verse 15, that he went to a mountain himself alone in Matthew and Mark's account of this very story of uh, Jesus walking on the water and them going out. We're told that he went up on the mountain and prayed and he was praying for the disciples. He was praying for them. And we learn, I think it's in Mark's account, we learn that he could see them struggling as they're rowing through this storm. And these, keep in mind, were fishermen. Very used to see the sea life and being out there on uh, this, this great sea. Um, and apparently this, this storm came, came up and it was enough to where they were f fearful. Um, and so Jesus comes out to them. Verse 20 goes on, John 6, 20. But he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Well then, they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. The day following... <laughs> When the people with, uh, which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat that uh, there except that one wherein his disciples were entered, and that Jesus were not with his disciples, went not with them into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, howbeit there came an other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread, after that, the Lord had given thanks. Verse 24, John 6, 24. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum, seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sore, the, the sea, uh, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? He baffled them. He was he was uh, able to appear here and appear there. And um, Jesus was more than just a man. He was more than just a prophet, more than just a priest, uh, more than a, a king. These people, though, wanted to humanize him. They wanted to make him something that they could uh, control, really, something that they could understand, even. And the same thing goes on today, where people want to understand everything about God, everything about uh, Jesus, and the fact of the matter is you cannot. Um, it is an endless uh, sea. To, to just the the 66 books that we have written by 40 some 40 different authors um, only give us a tip of the iceberg that is God <laughs> Jesus the Holy Spirit it's it's really true this is so uh, there's it's such a vast um, a great amount of of things we can we learn and we continue to learn about him. Um, but one thing I didn't I almost forgot to mention was after this great miracle, this great feeding of the five thousands, uh, five thousand when 
Jesus broke the bread, gave thanks. Remember, there was uh, five loaves and two fish, and he was able to, to feed probably more like 10,000 to 15,000 people. Um, when you think the 5,000, that number is counting men only. Um, that we're not told about the, the, the young children and the women that would be there. So, um, either way, it was this incredibly prosperous, uh, really <laughs> fascinating, and it would have been exciting, this kind of a mountaintop experience for them there in, in that place, in, uh, where, where uh, Philip, remember it was Bethsaida, Philip's hometown, um, where that had happened. And what's, what's incredible is the next thing that happens is a storm, a trial, where, again, they're struggling at the oars in Mark's account of this. And they're really going through a hard time, a hardship. And I have found this so to be true. No matter where I am, um, where you are maybe, where, where anyone of you might be, after a great time of feasting <laughs> with 5,000 other people, with, with Jesus supplying and providing all your needs according to His riches, uh, Philippians 4.19, I believe, um, supplying all our needs according to His riches, His glory, then comes Monday. <laughs> then comes the hardships, the trials, the tribulation, the time of testing. And Jesus sent them into the storm. And it's very interesting that... Um, Oftentimes, that's how it is. God, the very, the very one who provided for us, he will allow us and even send us into this time of trying, of testing, of squeezing, of pressure, so that he can make something great out of you. Um... Every, every trial that you go through, every pressure, every hardship that you go through, it's for a reason. There is a purpose. And He has such great plans. Higher than the heavens are from the earth are His ways, are His plans. So much greater, so much better than ours. Uh, again, John 6 um, that great feast of feeding 5,000, the next thing that comes is a storm. And you can take that one to the bank. You have such an incredible time with the Lord, maybe on a retreat, on a camping trip, um, just even a personal time of revelation where the Lord just, just gives you this great word, this great encouragement. Hey, <laughs> the... Turn the corner and something's going to hit you from out of nowhere. Something's just going to send you into a storm, a trial. And how you react shows what's inside. You cannot know if the sponge is wet until you squeeze it. How much water is in the sponge? Same way with you and I. He does not know how genuine your faith is, how genuine your love is, and trust and obedience to Him truly is until you are squeezed. <laughs> he does, does He do the squeezing? No. He allows that, but let no man ever say that I'm tempted by God or that He's the one sending me um, and He's the one... <laughs> it's His fault, His fault. No, He is the, the one in control... But in, and we, we get upset, we can get upset that He allows this thing to happen. He allows these things 
to happen in our lives. But be of good cheer. He has overcome the world. Jesus would say, do not be afraid. Uh, John 6, 20. Um, and we continue on. And I find it fascinating. You have a group of people now following him. And, and they're amazed that he beat them to the other side of the sea. Um, and they're scratching their heads. When did you get here, Lord? In verse 24, as we read. Uh, or verse 25 at the end of the verse. Uh, and then verse 26, Jesus answers them and says, John 6, 26, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Interesting, this reply, this answer by Jesus. You're only looking to see what else I can give. Verse 27 goes on. John 6, 27. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that meat which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you. For him has God the Father sealed. Wow. Now that's some powerful words from our Lord. God the Father has sealed him. Like the, uh, a lot like the saints in the tribulation in, uh, John, in Revelation with the seals, the seven seals there that we read about. Um, God the Father has confirmed, has, has made it totally uh, f final. This is my son. This is the one. The only, Jesus Christ. Um, but his answer rings true from century to century, decade to decade, year to year, day to day, hour by hour. Seek the bread, and he's going to go on to seek and talk about and not laboring for the bread, or sorry, the meat, that perishes, but for the meat that which endures forever unto everlasting life. How many of us are toiling and spinning our wheels and it's for something that's fading away, that's perishing, that's, that just doesn't last? Man. <laughs> It's, it's really important for us to remember 2 Peter. I wrote, first time I'm looking at my notes, by the way. I went that whole time with no notes. <laughs> 2 Peter 3.10. In 2 Peter 3.10 we learn that the earth and the elements thereof, everything on this planet, will melt away with fervent heat. That's what the Bible says, not what I believe, not, um, <laughs> sorry, not, not what I uh, have come up with on my own. I believe it because the Bible says it, is what I meant to say. <laughs> That's what the Bible says, 2 Peter 3, 9, uh, 3, 10. Everything you have, everything I have, is firewood. And I say that because we get so consumed by our possessions. And it's okay to have stuff as long as you have the stuff and the stuff doesn't have you. It's okay to have possessions as long as the possessions don't possess you. And to have everything and hold everything with an open hand and say, you give, you take away. Blessed be your name. It's, it's the attitude of gratitude. It's the only way to truly be happy in Jesus is to trust and obey that He is in control, that every good and perfect gift comes from Him. And the thing is, is we get so into our stuff and we forget that it's just stuff. 
and it's here for a bit, we'll have it, and then we'll lose it. That's fine. It's just stuff. And when that stuff starts to become more than something, we start to say, I can't live without that or this. And when that happens, we have to watch it. We have to keep our eyes on the eternal. Set your eyes on things above, not on things of the world, not on temporary things, but on things that are eternal, things that last, things that matter. Labor not for the meat which perishes. You know, don't just work so that you can eat. Work hard and labor to really enter into the rest that's available 24-7. He is our rest. He is my peace. He passes all understanding. Um, well, then they, they reply, and I love this, this section in John 6, this is a powerful one. John 6, 28. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And, and you might ask that. I ask that sometimes. How can I help you out, God? How can I work for you? How can I do... What, what must I do that I could earn the kingdom of heaven or that I could earn salvation Jesus' answer is classic it should be marked it should be highlighted underlined in your Bible John 6 29 Jesus answered and said unto them this is the work of God that ye believe on him who, whom he has sent him whom he hath sent that is Jesus Christ speaking of himself. That is Jesus Christ. Do you believe in Jesus? Or are you believing that the prayer that you prayed as a little boy or the baptism that you went under, that that did something for you? Or that that prayer that you prayed, that the so many uh, scriptures that you've memorized or so many sermons that you've preached, whatever it might be, are you holding on to that? I hope not, because Jesus makes it very clear. This is the work of God. Believe. It's, that's it. And it goes against everything in our nature to just simply believe and to simply cling on to Him, to cling unto the Father, and just let go of your works, your religion, your traditions, your books, <laughs> your writings, whatever they may be that you're holding on to, that somehow that has earned your way. Let go and let God. <laughs> and believe God. His word is true. Jesus is <laughs> the answer. It's believing in Jesus. That's such a key. John 6, 29. Memorize it. This is the work of God, that you would believe on Him whom He has sent. Quit trying so hard when all you have to do, all you must do, is believe. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart. Jesus Christ is been risen, has, has, has uh, died on the cross for you, and has raised from the dead. And that He lives. He lives. Now it comes up, and I hope I'm not running too long here. Are you guys enjoying the study? I hope so. Um, you have plenty of time. Uh, all you have is time. Um, so let's keep going. John 6, 20, or sorry, John 6, 30. They said therefore unto him, What sign shows thou <laughs> then, what, what sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe you? <laughs> okay, you want us to believe in Jesus? Well, show us something so that we can believe you. Um, <laughs> what dost thou work? 
Verse 31, Our fathers did eat manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Well, then Jesus answers and actually corrects them. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes, uh, he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. The bread, the bread, the bread. He's going he's gonna to say it in just a few more verses. Um, I am, and, and we'll talk a little bit about the, uh, the great statement there. But something to point out is that, first off, what sign do you show us? He just got done feeding 5,000 people. That wasn't enough for him, apparently. Um, people are always looking for, oh, I'll believe it when I see it. And if you have that kind of attitude, don't. <laughs> don't have that attitude where I believe it if I see it. It's, it's so important, this whole key, that, and you will see it in God's Word, and throughout the Bible you will read it and, and come across this whole thing of faith. Faith comes by hearing. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. And I always note that yet, because it will be revealed. When our faith will be made sight, all will see one day. It is very soon. Send me an amen if you believe it. It's very soon <laughs> these things are going to become very evident to all. But that, that you would believe, more blessed, Jesus would say in another place, more blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Don't be one of those who, like these guys were in John 6, 30, 30 uh, yeah, John 6, 30. What sign will you show me? You know, if you just if you just show me this or show me that, then I'll believe. No. It's it's he he is and, and once you dive into this whole thing of faith, and it's not having faith in faith, it's having faith in him. Because there's a lot of misunderstanding about what faith is. You want to understand what faith is? Look at a man like Job in the Old Testament and you find him a man of faith who trusts in God. No matter what is happening around him, I trust you, Lord. I give my all to you. You give, you take away. Blessed be your name. And so don't be like these guys in John 6.30. John 6.30 where, show us a sign and that will, then we'll believe. What, what can you show us? And, and it's, it, I just find it humorous that he just got done feeding them. 5,000 people doing this incredible miracle. Well, this whole thing of manna. Another interesting note is that the manna was always referred to as manna by humans. The manna. The manna. And that word literally means, what is it? Manna. What is it? What is this stuff? And it's interesting that Jesus interprets it, and so does even the psalmist in another place. I didn't write that verse down, but the bread that came from heaven. God and Jesus, more particularly in the uh, Gospels here, Jesus always referred to it as the bread. And, they, and even in the Old Testament, when it's referred to as manna, 
It's only when God is speaking on human terms or from human perspective that it's seen as manna. So that's kind of an interesting note. Uh, but it was the bread of heaven. The bread that came down from heaven. Another interesting thing about man, the manna in the wilderness is that they all had to take it for themselves. They could not take it for their brother, for their sister, for their mom, or for their dad, or for their sons, or for their daughters. Every man had to collect it for themselves. And it's that same way Jesus is like that today. You cannot make someone have a relationship with Jesus. And that's what it's about, by the way, is relationship, not religion. I'm sorry, I don't seem to be looking at this camera hardly ever, so um, for the YouTube watchers later on, uh, you'll <laughs> forgive me. Um, I'm not used to the two camera thing. Anyways, if, uh, if we just look at the manna and see that that was a type of Jesus, of, of Christ, back, and, and really that relationship that each and every one of us are to have with Him. You cannot force anyone, you cannot make your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, your, no matter what, your aunt, your uncle, your cousin, you cannot make them have a relationship with Jesus. And in the same way, they had to take up the manna, each one, for themselves are you taking it up and it had to be a daily thing because if you tried to save it and that's an interesting fact if you tried to tuck it away well I'm safe now I've got the manna and it's in the jar and and now it's it's tucked away no you take it out and it'd be crawling with maggots and and uh, moldy and just the next day and if we do that with Jesus if we just Okay, I've, I've sang a few songs, I, I read the Bible, I'm good for a couple days, I'm good for a week. No, it's a daily thing, the daily bread. Are you taking in the daily bread? Are you doing it for yourself? Um, you can't do it for another. And I, I just found that to be very refreshing to, to see that again. He is the bread, um, for the bread of God. Oh, and then he corrects them, and, and that's also interesting. In verse 32, in John 6, 32, he, Jesus corrects them on two points. That, um, because they had said, our fathers did eat manna, he gave them bread from heaven. And, and the question is, who are they speaking of? The he. They, they could be thinking Moses gave the people bread from heaven. And I think that by Jesus' answer, we could say that, that that is what they were uh, referring to. That it was Moses that gave them bread in the wilderness. And Jesus corrects them and says, No, Moses did not give you, in verse 32, John 6, 32, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven. It was God the Father. It was my Father in heaven who gives you the bread. And, and then his second correction is that the bread speaks of Jesus. The manna speaks of Jesus. Now read further on, further down, John 6, 34. Then they said unto him, Lord, evermore, give us this bread. Sounds pretty good. I want some. You know, that's, again, going back to uh, verse uh, uh, 26. Uh, wh why are you looking for Jesus? Why are you seeking Jesus? Is it so that you can get more bread? Uh, more, more stuff? Too many people come and only want what's on the king's table. They want the stuff that the king can give. Not enough people just want to hang out with the king. Just hang out with him. Are you one that just looks for what you can get? out of whatever, any relationship. Don't let that be with your relationship with God. Don't ever come to Him and, what can I get from Him? Listen, the greatest reward 
when we get to heaven. It doesn't matter if your grandma, if your brother, if your your son, if your daughter, if your wife, if your mother. It doesn't matter if any of them are there in heaven. Now oh, you're insensitive, Mike. <laughs> My reward is the Lord. Just hanging out with Him. It doesn't matter who else is there. That's just a plus, a bonus, whatever. But let that be your motive. Let that be your heart. It's a relationship. What kind of relationship is that? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll hang out with you and I'll follow you and I'll be faithful to you. I'll be your servant, O oh Lord, all these, all these years so that I can be with my wife in heaven for eternity. Or so that I can be with my dog in heaven for eternity. Or so I can be with my kid that died, you know, and my baby I don't mean to, to be harsh or insensitive, but these things are so vital to our walk with God. It's called motive, and only God knows it. Only God knows why you do what you do. We only see what people do. Only God knows why anyone does what they do. Uh, what, that's another thing that I wrote in my notes. What is it that, that makes you get out of bed in the morning? What is it that causes you uh, to, and drives you to, to work and to interact and to just get up and live life? Is it money? Is it sex? What is it? Is it uh, pride? <laughs> Being noticed? There, there can be so many things that we are driven by what is your master passion? I hope it's Christ. I hope that it's Him and Him alone. Because so many other things try to take that position. So many other things will find their way up onto that throne that Christ belongs on. He is on the throne. Well then... They want the bread. <laughs> the thing that br brings this whole thing out, the thing that brought up this whole, whole issue, is give us this bread. It sounds great. You know, it comes down from heaven, from God Himself. Verse 35, Jesus said unto, him, unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, that ye also have seen me, and believe not? All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. That's an awesome verse to underline. It's John 6, 37. Everyone that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. Maybe you feel like it's been, I've been hardened, hearted, I've been calloused, I'm way too far away from God and from His Word and from prayer. Listen, if you come to Him, if you call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. You, and, and He in no wise will cast out. Now that is a daily thing. It's not a one-time thing. Oh, you did it when you were 12. You did it when you were 6. You did it when you were that age or whatever. No, that's great that you got saved. What have you done with it? One of, one of my favorite teachers, Bible teachers, said that. <laughs> that's great that you got saved, but what have you done with it? Where, where, where is it now? Where are you now? Great question to ask. For I came down from heaven, John 6, 38. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again in the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up 
at the last day. And guess what they did at this? They murmured, complained. Again, taking it back to the days in the wilderness, where that manna in the wilderness made them complain and murmur and just just gripe about what it what it could have been, what they what they wanted from it. I'm going to talk a little bit more, not much longer, but this is the first of seven statements that Jesus makes in John's, the Gospel of John that start with, I am. And why is that important? I'll give them all to you here. Um, in John 8, 12, he's going to say, I am the light of the world. In John 10, 9, he says, I am the door or the gate. Uh, in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. In John 11, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. In John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, John 15, 1, I am the true vine. He has seven I am statements. Seven is also the number of perfection, completion, the, this world that we all enjoy. It was all created in how many days? Seven. Six days and he rested on the seventh. Seven has always been a significant number. And in the Gospel of John, which I, by the way, suggest any new believer, anyone who's just wanting to know what this Bible thing is all about. What does the Bible have to say about this or that? Start at the Gospel of John and it, you get to know Jesus right away. And and that's what that's the important thing to me. And here is the first of seven I am statements. John 6, 35. And it's I am the bread of life. The reason that's significant, though, is that is, I am is the name of God. Way back in Exodus chapter 3, in verses uh, 14. Uh, remember, Moses sees this incredible scene. It's a, a bush that's on fire, and it wasn't consumed. Now, that's, that's interesting, even on, by itself. The bush... The type of bush that it was, they, they call it um, the thorny bush of the desert. And he was in this area of Midian, um, in Exodus 3 again is where the story is. But thorns, thorns speak and take us back to Genesis, where the beginning of the curse, and it's always a picture of sin, and the curse of sin. And so here you have this thorny bush on fire. The sin, the curse, on fire by judgment. And that very bush can speak and does speak about judgment. The fire always symbolizes judgment. And, and the whole idea of it not being consumed that this bush would be on fire, it's, may, it's of thorns, speaking of sin again, and the judgment that would come, it speaks to you, it speaks to me of mercy. That we are not consumed because of how perverted, of how foul, how twisted we can be because of sin, because of the curse. We deserve to burn <laughs> in hell for all eternity. But because of Christ, because of the crown of thorns that was placed on His head, and the fire of God, the judgment that would come on that cross, the punishment that we deserved, that we would be incinerated, that we would be totally burnt up, the fact that we're not, speaks of His grace, of His mercy. Mercy is having held back that which you do deserve. Grace is just getting what you don't deserve. 
at all. And so that great scene at that bush, the, the burning bush, right? Back in Exodus 3. It's, cons it's, it's burning, but it's not consumed. And it's, again, such a powerful picture. I hope you see that. But Moses is called by God to go and deliver the people. And he says, who should I say sent me? And God, back in Exodus 3, verse 14, says, I am. That's the name of God. Don't ever let anyone convince you or try to convince you. Don't ever let anyone try to say, Jesus never said he was God. Jesus isn't God. He was just a great prophet, just a great teacher, just... Uh, listen, read through the Gospel of John. You will have to come to that conclusion yourself. Don't let me uh, try and... Uh, let me encourage you to do, it, do your own homework. To, to read it for yourself and see what conclusion you come to. Because they would stone him, pick up stones to stone him, as he called himself and as he put himself on equal plane with God. Why? Because he was. Because he is. I am. The other aspect to that whole statement is that it is present, ever present. Not I was, not I will be, but I am today, right here, 2020, April 23rd. I am your substance. I am what you need. I am all of the insecurities that you're feeling. I am the healing that you need. I am your defender. I am. You could go on and on and on. The list goes on as to all the things that truly God is. <laughs> truly Jesus is. And we're going to continue down this, uh, again, the seven I am statements are so powerful. Each time we go through them, um, each time we look at just one of them, here being the bread of life. Bread is something you need to live <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis. And it was speaking of food, really. It didn't necessarily have to be bread, although... Um, we remember him in the communion services by that unleavened bread because it was a feast, again, commemorating being brought out of bondage, out of slavery. They didn't have time to cook the leaven in the bread. They brought it. It was unleavened bread. Again, leaven always speaks of sin. Who is the only one without sin, without leaven? And the bread of life, Jesus He's the, he is the way, the truth, the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. We're going to see that later on in John as well. Well, there was one more song I think I was going to sing just to close out. Thank you guys, every one of you, for joining here. here I hope you're all doing well. And again... I thought I tuned it, but if you uh, if the video is pausing or anything like that on here, you can go to YouTube, search Calvary Chapel of Santa Rosa, and you get all the studies. Uh, they will not pause. You won't have any. They're not live, but at least they're there for anyone that wants to look. It's a lonely life. When no one wants to give time to you, they 